The Hewlands annual ball was for all intents and purposes a front for the biggest night of debauchery and sexual deviancy each year. Folk from all over Sembia, peasantry and nobility alike, flocked to the event. It was, indeed, the most important gathering of the season. It was common knowledge that the night of the ball was the one day of the year that Selgont opened its doors to. Other races aside from humans and halflings, not a great variety, but some nonetheless. Just in case you, the reader, are unaware of certain facts, let me now explain them to you in detail. The first fact is this. Elves, as far as it can go, were not allowed in the city of Selgont. It stemmed all the way back to before the time of troubles, back when the hill-dwelling and light forest-dwelling elves inhabited the land of Symbia, when humans first began to migrate from Cormia and the other human settlements along the Sword Coast. Suffice to say, there was a goodly amount of warring between the humans and elves, with heavier casualties on the side of the elves, as they indeed were rooted out of their homes, enslaved or killed, or driven off, and made to suffer greatly. There was a lot of death and rape and hatred seed between the two races of Sembia, until there were no more elves to be found in these lands. Human Maximilian II abolished slavery during the end of that horrible feudal period, and that clinched the deal for the elves. It was leave or be killed. So, they left, and the law of the land was decreed. No elves are to set foot in Sembia unless they are passing through to Cormia, or down the sword coast some ways, just past Sembia and any elf to break this law would be subject to death. Without remorse and with prejudice, that's the first fact. Here's the second. All half-breed elven human hybrid children were shunned by the vast majority, except in places like, say, Alun, or small hamlets in the Archwood who didn't have the prejudices that the rest of the Sembian nation did. Half-elves were the black sheep of Sembian society, being ostracized to the extent of that meaning. Oftentimes, these poor half-breeds were bullied and beaten, and raped and killed at no fault of their own. How could they be responsible for what they were? More often than not, they were the results of rape. Almost always the raping of an elvish female by a human male. As elves don't have that tenacity in their nature to commit acts against nature, such as rape. However, there were rare instances where the wars between elves and humans hadn't affected certain folk. Some folk just didn't have it in them to feel the hatred and animosity. Some would even go so far as to say that there were folk amongst the human population who, indeed, loved the elf kin. Some even would say that the love between human and elf was so complete as to result in a coupling that led to the birth of a half-elven newborn, made from the forementioned love. Rare indeed, yet, rarer still, was a newborn, birthed from a human mother with an elven father. These were so rare as to be undocumented, and there were differences between these half-elven children of human mothers and the ones of elven mothers. The human birth half-breeds were far less elvish in appearance and had hardly a trace of physical attributes that constituted one of the elvish stock. These half-elf babies grew up at roughly half the rate of their elven ancestry and about twice the rate physically of their human ones. Luckily for them, as far as Sembian society was concerned, they looked like humans. Aside from the perhaps very slight almond shape to the eyes, or fair skin with a milky quality to it, if they were from moon elf stock, or they were very petite, or shorter than humans by a bit, or very slender. But for the most part, these hybrid children simply looked like humans to the regular citizenry. There was another plus side to being a human born half-elf, and that was this. While they appeared fully human, aside from the slight or rare aberrations I spoke of just before, they were blessed by the elvish gods with many and in some cases very many of the attributes that came as a natural evolutionary gift to any full-blooded elf these hybrid elves had the eyesight of their elvish kin with low light vision sometimes even no light vision and increased dexterity in their abilities physically and oftentimes they were also blessed with the supersonic hearing of the elves and balance and ability to track nature's creatures and tame many of the wild beasts of the lands. They had a natural instinct for survival in nature, and were able to blend in with the trees, or prairie grasses, or riverbeds. They also, as yet another bonus, oftentimes had sorcerous abilities that came, as all sorcery comes, naturally, and suddenly upon its inception. There were tales of half-elven adolescents suddenly, evoking energetic beams from their outstretched palms, or turning invisible without meaning to do so, or other similar happenstances. One could say that if one was a half-elf of a human mother, that if they were able to manage to hide their elvish blood,
completely from the human population that they could easily become very rich and very powerful, which was the way of any Sembite by nature to attempt. Now, you may be wondering why I have taken this path, this tangent as it were. Well, the answer to that is quite simple. The woman and thief and beauty beyond other women of her peers and intelligence surpassing her friends and other folk about her and her athleticism and balance and uncanny ability to hear, see, or otherwise become aware of pretty much everything before anyone else around her did. The woman named Auli, for a fact, was one of these rare half-breed folk, herself of an elvish father. But, even rarer than anything I've spoken on so far, was the case of Miss Auli Duresti. Unlike other half-elves of her rare condition, she was rarer still, for she had a mother who was not fully human, but in fact was a half-elf herself. This dynamic was so very seldom heard of that the rarity could be called unique beyond the normal boundaries of the meaning of the word. Rare did not suffice. Auli, indeed, was one of a kind, a unicorn, so to speak, of creation, blessed with the best attributes of her elvish kin, and those of her human ancestry. Auli, herself, did not realize this, of course, having been adopted by a human man, at birth, named Corvin Duresti, a Chondath and Taylor, who immigrated from the Chondathlands to Selgont. Years before, Auli's father, a moon elf named Frui Lantalaska, was murdered in cold blood by the father and uncle of Auli's mother, a half-elvish beauty herself, named Cecil Taiwani. The Taiwani family was not aware of Cecil's half-elven lineage, so naturally, when they found out that the eldest daughter of their noble and powerful merchant family had become pregnant by a whore son, moon elf, they reacted in line with the rest of the Sembite population, for the most part, and incited a plot to kill Aula's poor father with haste. The subsequent death of Aula's father caused a complete and total breakdown of Cecile's psyche. She fell first into depression and then, eventually, into madness. This madness led to her, unfortunately, taking her own life by way of poisoning herself, leaving her newborn child in the hands of her family. The Tabernese saw the child as an abomination and blamed Auli for the resulting destruction of their once regal family. Even so, Auli's aunt, Edna, had taken a liking, and indeed a loving, towards the infant, and when the Taiwani patriarchy proposed putting the infant to death, she spoke up, and as the eldest matriarch of the Taiwani family, put her foot down, offering a solution that resulted in the baby staying alive, and the Taiwani family reading itself of the cursed abomination that was Auli. They would consign an adopted parent to Auli, to raise her as his own, and tell her the story of how her mother died giving birth to her, and that he was her father, and raised her as best he could, and so forth. So, Corvin Duresti, the tailor from Shondath, raised his adopted daughter as best he could, and told her the story her was sworn to tell, and never told her the entire truth of her lineage, and therefore never imparted upon Auli just how truly special and powerful she was. Aside from half-breeds, being special was a feature that was given only to those of a high-born nature, and indeed, it was given by the goddess of beauty, Sunni, and, as Sunni was the only one who could hand down such a blessing, it only stood to reason that I, Lady Letitia Sway, Countess of the Sembite House of Sway, ruler of all the lands from Sayalun to the boundaries of Selgord, would and should be a faithful of Sunni to my very soul. And so it was, that I found myself surrounded, of course, by all manner of randy gents, desperate to have the chance, unfortunately for them, since I wouldn't entertain a chance for any of these lot, at bedding me, or at the very, least getting a taste of what was betwixt my legs, and, of course, again, I would tease these dogs, these foul, smelly, slathering, morums, without a single shred of debonair, or otherwise alluring qualities between them all. Yes, I would leave them on, smiling at them with my perfect teeth, full lips, and sparkling dark brown eyes. It was my job to do so, you see, for I had been hired to call the so-called wheat from the chaff, and siphon the dregs right back out the door, from whence they had slithered into the Hewlands' ball.
Hugh and Thomas had truly outdone himself this year. The mansion, having been remodeled since last year's festivities, was absolutely and completely beautiful. The manner in which the wall designers of the interior had assembled the light, especially, was impressive to me. The perfect balance of illumination and yet the allowance of certain areas where shadows danced and the glow of the light would flicker magically was absolutely superb, I thought, and I was supremely correct in this thought, that nobody was of benefit more than myself, of the manner in which the light played off my flawless skin, and twinkled in my deep pools of lust known as my eyes, yes, it was indeed my element, and I loved attending the Hewlands wonderful event of such sexy, classy, depraved and filthy wonderment, all together at once, I knew all I had to do was wait until I could manage to send the last of the undesirable fox who attended the ball home as comfortably as I could without letting them get their hands upon my rump, breasts or pussy and I would yet again, just like the previous years before get my pick of the select number of attendees of quality that, as of yet, remained safely tucked away amongst the throng having escaped for a moment or two out into the gardens. I took a deep breath of the clear, clean night air. The air was scented of hibiscus and lavender and was so aromatic that I found myself closing my eyes to breathe it in, slowly, savoring it. I opened my eyes again, feeling the effects of what I knew to be coffers of opium and mind dust placed all around the gardens, spewing the narcotic smoke throughout to relax, entice and uninhibit the guests of the Hewlands Ball. The scent was absolutely intoxicating in itself, and I cannot think, even to this day, of a finer smell in all the world. So, there I was, relaxing, finally alone for a time, away from the groveling, hovering, stifling group of noblemen, high-born fops, and Sembite government officials, all pawing at me with desperation and lust. I decided I would stroll, so I did. I strolled down a tightly shorn hedgerow path deeper into the beautiful gardens. The scent of the opium and hibiscus mixing with gardenias, roses and lilacs, creating a floral aroma that knew no rival. Becoming very relaxed now, I felt the urge to smoke. From my dainty purse, I drew out a leather pouch I always carried within it, filled with the finest mist leaf there was ever to exist. I'd had it imported from the Kalem Desert, only the gods know what it must have taken a courier to get it all the way to Zambia, from Kalimshan, and the perils one must have had to endure. I shudder to think of it. I was an adventurous woman, but not an adventurer. I appreciated the comforts of home, and the idea of traveling through lands filled with all manner of beasts, magical creatures, and other perils aside, did not make me happy. No, indeed. What made me happy was being touched all over my naked body by the strong masculine hands of the adventurer who was willing to travel where i was not i loved being caressed by hands like that i loved being touched between my thighs and upon my breasts and neck and then have fingers brush my cheek then travel down and enter my pussy then slide up my body once again so i could taste myself as they parted my lips softly i needed to be touched by strong sure hands that already knew where to travel and then acted upon that knowledge to bring me into the heights of orgasmic pleasure i needed those hands to take full hold of my rump squeezing my plump cheeks with a loving and forceful grasp pulling me onto the swollen throbbing cock that no doubt stood erect with masculine passion entering inside of me as he thrust his big hard cock into my twat i shuddered feeling myself become aroused by my thoughts striking a tender twig I lighted the cigar, I'd been rolling, as I'd let my mind wander, into sexual deviancy. That was what this event of the Hewlands was all about in the first place. The fact that he'd hired me to distract, then sent home the foppish imbeciles, who had been groping my ass and pinching my nipples, and thighs and butt cheeks all night was just an extra payday, nothing more. As soon as I finished with my job, I was going to enjoy the sexual hedonism of the ball during the later hours into the morning ones just like the other guests who managed to remain until the midnight hour i found myself running a hand down my own thigh 
licking my own lips as I blew a long draw of mistly smoke from between them. The purple-gray smoke bloomed out in a cloud, wafting around the immediate area, surrounding me like a fog or a mist. It was then, as I lazily gazed through the smoke, peering into the gardens lazadacically, that I thought I'd seen a movement from. Just off to the right side of my vision, down towards the shadow of a huge cypress tree, that stood as one of a trio of cypress trees, all bunched in a copse. I leaned forward, the bench I was sitting on creaking slightly when I shifted my weight, and I stared into the dusk. The light from the suns above Toriel had only just sunk below the horizon, leaving a glowing, purplish hue caressing the sky, though it was dark enough already that I had to peer into the distance towards the copse of trees where I'd thought I'd seen something or someone move into a shadowed nook of the cypress. There was nobody else nearby me, nor did I spy anyone between myself and the copse of cypress trees, which stood about the stone's throw from where I sat. I was the only person around, aside from the unknown person, if that indeed was what I saw, who was hidden. And in my mind's eye crouched, down there far off in that shadow, it was then I saw that I'd been mistaken, and there indeed was someone else nearby, a sentry, one of the Hewland's personal guards from the looks of him, strolled slowly towards the cypress tree. The tree, itself, stood only a few paces from the south wall of the Hewland's mansion. On the other side of the wall I knew to be a livery. I was now intrigued by my vision of the shadow spectre or person or nothing, or whatever it was I thought I could even see now. Crouched in the shadow of the cypress tree, the sentry seemed oblivious to anyone nearby him, so maybe I was wrong, for he stood only paces from where I'd seen the unknown shadow. The sentry was fumbling with something in his pocket, which turned out to be a tender twig, which he was struggling to light. Eventually, almost comically, he succeeded in the lighting of the twig, and a space of about an arm's length in front of him, and to each side, was illuminated, brightly, as the sulfurous fume took flame. And it was then, that I saw her. I saw, crouched within the shadowed earth, nearby the huge cypress, now lighted by the fume of the tinder twig. Lighted very briefly, in fact, but for that brief few moments of light, what I saw was truly, the most beautiful face on a human being. I had ever seen, in my entire life, on the surface of Toriel. The woman, for a woman it was, was truly breathtakingly, startlingly in fact, beautiful, beyond description. I gasped, in awe, at her visage. So amazingly gorgeous and nymph-like she was, like those fairy tales you were told as a child, of beautiful fay, moving through the aether of an enchanted forest. That was this woman. She was short, perhaps, though she was also crouched so her height was hard to determine, but she looked petite, and in fact, perfectly so. I could see that she wore dark leather armor, over black leggings and black, tightly fitted shirt that covered her skin from her neck down completely, making her blend into the shadows very well. The only way I ever would have caught a glimpse was the manner in which I was, at that moment, by the light of a flame. She was so pretty, I cannot stress that enough. I took what moments I could to take in as much of her as I could, underneath that tightly fitted leather armor of hers, one could see that she had a perfectly proportioned, at least in my view, a perfectly proportioned body, her thighs were shapely, and led to what I could only imagine to be a perfectly plump, round hind quarters, no doubt toned, for she was extremely fit and healthy, she had a small waist, from what I could see and I imagined a very well-defined abdomen there under that armor. Her breasts were petite, and just the right size, and it was everything I could do not to undress her. With my eyes and imagine putting her nipples into my mouth, she exuded sexuality, or perhaps it was my own sexuality, projecting onto her. Ready and able template, for that was what I saw, a template of all beauty and desire. Her visage was like that of the most perfect sculpture chiseled in the Amish fashion, with a finely lined jaw, slender neck, dark brown hair, currently tied up, and twisted in two braids, tied to her head, a cowl covering the back half of it, her eyes, though I could not see them in entirety, glinted a greenish, aqua blue tone, in the light, I stood there, mouth agape in what I can only describe as starstruckedness, 
like when one meets the queen of a noble kingdom for the first time but tenfold for this woman surpassed any queen i'd ever seen in beauty and mystical lore who was she what in the world was she doing there in the shadows the sentry was right on top of her and was just about to spot her when all of a sudden a noise like the click clack of a rock falling to the cobbles came resounding through the night I saw the sentry snap his head round towards the noise, and then move off the direction from whence the sound had come. As he did, the twig went out and the woman was shrouded once again in shadow and I, sadly, could see her no more. I was fairly certain that I was unknown to either the sentry or the mystery woman. So, my curiosity and allure, getting the best of me, I moved down the path towards the copse of cypress trees slowly and as stealthy as I could. I kept my eyes, trained on the shadow the woman was hiding within, and as I got closer, I didn't find her any easier to spot. I was almost upon the nook where she had been crouched, when I realized that she had somehow, though I know not how, managed to climb up the tree, and vault over to the balcony of the mansion's south side, the one that had the onyx door. I spotted her then, though I do not believe that she saw me. I was now, having seen her do it before me, hiding within the shadow of the cypress, spying her with excitement and intrigue. What an adventure this was becoming already. Yet, who was this woman? Why did she seem to be breaking into the Hewlands mansion? His doors were open to all, for God's sake. It was the one single day of the year that they were. I had to find out.